press record. Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name's Florence and I'm helping to run this workshop on behalf of the Hypatia Trust. Um, just a bit about us, uh, we're a women's educational charity based in Penzance and this talk is part of our current heritage project, Women of Cornish Music Past and Present. Um, a bit of context for the project, we kicked off in January this year um, obviously a lot of our plans were events um, held in person, but we're still delivering the main thrust of this project, which is to highlight and celebrate the musical achievements of women in Cornwall um, and address a very male dominated area of local heritage um, and also boost women's confidence in, in areas such as experimental music, electronic music conducting, um, places where women are still very underrepresented today. Um, each Friday, Hilary Coleman, which you see on screen, has been meeting with our volunteer research group on Zoom. Um, do you want to say a little bit there, Hilary, about what you guys have been up to for this part of the project? Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, so uh, when we, you know, we, I literally had just taken on the work <clears throat> when uh, the a lockdown was announced. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was a bit of a panic on how we were going to carry on, because obviously we wanted to go to all the archive centres in Cornwall. Um, what happened in the end was, as Florence said, we um, started doing Zoom meetings and uh, began to invite um, people to come and talk to us. And we've had some great discuss talks <coughs> from women who have been doing research. And um, <clears throat> I've known Leah for quite a few years um, through my work with traditional Cornish music. And um, so I thought it'd be brilliant to have her come to talk to us. When she then told us a bit more about what she was proposing to, to deliver, we thought this just sounds so great, we should open it up to the public. So um, yeah, that's kind of the background to how we got to where we are today. Brilliant. Um, just to introduce Leah briefly, um, Leah's an, a lecturer in ethnomusicology at the University of Bern in Switzerland and is joining us today from Switzerland, which is pretty cool, the wonders of Zoom, um, and is also the Director of Studies in World Arts and Music, I think that's right, um, with a keen interest in Cornish music as well, so we're really thrilled to have her here today. Um, just a bit of housekeeping on Zoom, if you're new to using Zoom webinar, um, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom to type in questions and also use the chat for comments. Um, and we'll have hopefully a little bit of time at the end for questions, I think we'll sort of play that by ear. Um, and we are recording the talk, but you're not identifiable and we probably won't be making it public either, so don't worry about that. Um, I think that's it from me. Leah, shall I hand over to you? And we're going to take ourselves off screen, me and Hilary, so give you a bit of space. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Thanks so much, Hilary, for inviting me for this talk. And also thank you, Florence, for organizing it all with a wonderful flyer. And uh, I'm really excited. Um, originally, this talk was only um, addressed towards Cornish people, Cornish musicians and people of this project. But now I heard that people are joining in from various countries within um, Europe. And I'm in Europe in the broad sense. So including Britain and everybody and Switzerland. And um, today we're going to talk about female figures in Cornish songs. So what we have to do is we have to start off with defining what actually are Cornish songs. And I'll tell you that is not too easy to answer this question. Um, and then we have to have a little bit of background about music revival theory. Uh, what is actually music revival? That is the main area of my research. And I'm just gonna give you a very, very brief definition there. And then we'll go on um, to the research question for this talk today, which are aimed at the songs and the female figures in the songs before starting a journey through the centuries. So first of all, we're gonna go through the 17th century late Cornish song texts and broadside ballads. We're going to go to the 18th century Cornish ballad carols. They're also called folk carols and they're not the carols that you might be thinking of, the ones that um, are sung in church or have been sung in church for a long time. Uh, and then we'll go to the British folk songs. Um, I put British there because you cannot really extract Cornish from that whole bunch of songs that were collected. Um, but of course, we'll focus on the songs that were collected within Cornwall. 
And then we'll also focus on the 20th century uh, new songs in English and in Cornish. And here I mean all sorts of varieties of Cornish, uh, different orthography, orthographies, different styles, and also, of course, different dialects uh, within Cornwall in English. Um, and then we'll come to the uh, music revival, the Cornish music revival, which is the focus of my research and which I date as starting roughly from the 1980s, maybe late 70s. And this is something which is going on today as well. And uh, then hopefully we'll come to a conclusion. So what are Cornish songs? Well, Tricky question, difficult question. It's always difficult to find definitions, but uh, the definitions that I would find here or suggest are that they are songs that originate in Cornwall and it doesn't really matter whether they're considered to be um, part of the traditional folk, um, um, folk genre or trad genre or whether they're composed and the composers are known. So all of them are Cornish songs. And um, they're songs written by Cornish men, Cornish women, and defined as Cornish songs. They could be also songs referring to Cornwall, for, for instance, if they've got place names um, which indicate uh, locations in Cornwall. And they're songs in Cornish and in English, and as I, as I said before, in different varieties. And they're also songs that probably originated somewhere else, but were then adopted and are still being sung in Cornwall or have been sung for a certain time. And I think this is the area where Sally Burley and Hilary Coleman presented um, their project on a couple of weeks ago. So they are also Cornish songs, of course they are. And for me, the most uh, important definition I would say is Cornish songs for me are songs that have played or play a significant role in Cornwall. And I'd like to quote here uh, Ralph Dunstan, who in the introduction to his Kanakarno, his Cornish songbook, uh, gives the following definition, songs which have entered into the hearts and lives of the Cornish people demand the first place. So let's start with a Cornish song. Um, this is my very favorite, my favorite um, Cornish song. And it's also the very first Cornish song I ever heard. That was in 2008. And it was in Penryn, it, in what was then called Miss Peapot's Cafe. I think it's called The Wharf nowadays. And there was a session going on and um, I went along with my landlord, with Russell Pascoe. I think he's online today as well. And um, Dala gave a session there. So first there was a concert and then followed the session. And the first song that they sang was Den Junka Gerno, which is Cornish and it means the young man of Cornwall. Yeah, it doesn't have a woman in the title, but it is still a bit about the women, as Hilary Colwan will um, tell you in a second. So this is a recording from YouTube. I hope you hear it. It's always tricky with Zoom sound quality. Um, and yeah, let's see how she introduces this song. dance beautifully to this one. It's called Den Junk, which means young man. Uh, Denyung Kagerno, the young man of Cornwall, um, and as many of you know, that many many Cornish men uh, left because of the uh, mining crash, or in the 1800s. Many of them, yes, went off uh, around the world, and uh, there's a famous saying: "Wherever there's a hole in the ground, you'll find a Cornishman." Um, but what happened to the women? That's what I want to know. And in this song, this is a, it's a little bit about the women that were left behind, uh, the very strong, um, uh, determined women who. Uh, had to keep their family and their lives going. So, Dean Young, I go now. Okay. 
Okay, I'll have to stop here, unfortunately. Uh, this song, as you heard, was bilingual. So it started off uh, in Cornish and then uh, Beck Appleby sang the second um, voice in English. And um, as Hilary said, this is not only about the young man leaving Cornwall, but it's also about the woman who stays behind. And um, I decided to always mark the texts uh, which define the women or describe female figures in yellow so that you can have a look at that. And then I'll put um, always some of the most important keywords that describe the female characters in that yellow box in the top right corner. So the woman we have here is somebody strong, determined, somebody managing her life, uh, even though she's left behind. And as you can see in the last line, her heart will prove faithful and true, even though life is really, really hard. So I'm not the only one who's really fond of this song. There is um, an Australian duo, uh, Kate Burke and Ruth Hazelton, who in 2015 also recorded this song on their album Declaration and they write about this song. This song is about Cornish emigration and is particularly significant in the, that it does so from a woman's perspective. Most often it was the men who left and the women who remained. So I really wanted to know what the source of this song was because I found it really fascinating to have this female perspective. And um, well locating the source was not too easy. Um, in the booklet of the CD, Ruse, which Dalla produced in 2007, we find the following, um, uh, the following source. So it's written in Junker Gurno, Young Man of Cornwall, and then below in the brackets, traditional translation, Anthony Snell. So I kind of presumed that um, this song must have been originally in English and then translated to Cornish by Anthony Snell. And I typed in Young Man of Cornwall in the Full English um, Archive, yeah, Full English Archive, which is uh, a digital archive, which is run by the English Folk Song and Dance Society. And it's a brilliant platform because there you can just type in some um, keywords or some phrases of a song or a title. And then they give you everything that kind of is connected to that song. So it could be audio recordings, it could be manuscripts, it could be publications. And even though the songs might not have the same titles, as they often don't do, um, it, it just connects everything. And the whole system is basically uh, based on Steve Routes numbering system. So in um, British songs, you have many kind of, I call them song complexes that belong together. So you, you have songs that might have similar stories, similar texts, but very different melodies. And it's, you wouldn't think that this is actually the same song. So the way he solved this problem was just giving a number to each of these song complexes. So anyway, I typed in Young Man of Cornwall, but nothing came up. And, and then I played around a bit with the word and I typed in a Cornish young man, and then I was successful. Um, what came up was what you can see on the right here, the Cornish young man. Uh, this is um, a publication uh, by Cecil Sharp. It's uh, the second volume of Folk Songs of Somerset, which appeared in 1911. And as you can see, he collected this song in Somerset. I don't really know how to pronounce this place name, Wish Episcopi, I don't know, from a uh, Frederick Crossman in 1904. And uh, on the left hand, you can see the transcription of the song that we just heard, the recording by Dalla. And of course, you only have to focus now on the first line if you, if you know how to read notes. 
Otherwise, you have to trust me that the melody is very, very similar. So if I'll just sing um, the beginning of uh, Cecil Sharp's notation, it goes like this. Na, 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 na. So maybe you still remember that melody we just heard and I, I'm sure you agree that it sounds very, very similar. Interestingly, however, the text is completely different. The text that uh, Sharp notates is the following. A Cornish young man, he dreamed a dream of the beautifulest girl in the nation. No counsel will he take, but some journey will he make through England to seek his fair creature. To a seven years he sought all about till he came to the place where he met her. He opened the door and she stood on the floor. She's a silly, poor laboring man's daughter. So we have a very different story here. And we also have a different perspective here. I mean, the narrator is unknown, but clearly the man is in the focus of this song. So I wondered um, if there is another source to this song. And I also wondered uh, why the, the text changed so much in Cornwall. And for the second question, I haven't found an answer yet, I have to say. And there is still one source which I will have to check once I'm back in Como, uh, which is not online, unfortunately. Um, but it could also be that um, Anthony Snell, the one who translated the text, wrote the lyrics himself um, because it was his uh, little booklet which circulary, circulated in the 1970s where this um, song was printed. But anyway, um, um, Baring Gould, yeah, was it Cecil Sharp or was it Baring Gould? It was uh, Cecil Sharp who gives us a, a possible source which is even older uh, of this song and this is a broadside ballad. Here you've got a print um, of Newcastle and the title changes here again so here it's called The Outlandish Night but then if you read through the text it is fairly similar to the folk song that uh, Cecil Sharp collected. An outlandish night he dreamed a dream, he beheld a most beautiful creature. No comfort he'd take, but a journey would make to England to find his fair creature. And for me, the most interesting part here is that uh, the night, the outlandish night is traveling to England, which means he is not in England. And uh, Cecil Sharp explains it that at the time when this was printed, and you can see the years um, below, that probably Cornish people were not considered English and therefore were regarded as coming from a different country. Um, and I know that most of the Cornish musicians listening to me today will be very happy about these news um, because Cornwall really likes to portray itself as a separate nation and not being part of England. So there you are, the outlandish night. And now if we go back just to summarize the story of the Nyunga Gurno, what we have is, first of all, we've got a broadside ballad, which was, um, well, it was printed in several places, uh, but also in the north of England, uh, Newcastle. Uh, and that happened before the British Folk Revival. The British Folk Revival started in around 1900. And there we can find this song, um, The Cornish Young Man, which became a folk song. I put folk into inverted commas here because it's a quite a tricky term and as you'll see uh, in a minute it's also a kind of construct that was made by the uh, antiquarians and folk collectors at the time. But anyway then we come to this very big purple line 1980 also a rough line of course where I would locate basically the start the beginning of the Cornish music revival and um, around 2000 we have another green number this for me is the beginning of um, a movement within the Cornish music revival, which is the Nosloan movement. And there we find our Cornish song. And uh, of course, it's interesting that this is a revived song. And for revived songs, it's very common that they kind of undergo a transformation from the kind of folk corpus to the, the song that we hear nowadays. And in our case, the transformation can be found in the language, so from English to Cornish, or at least bilingual. The story has changed. It's not anymore about a knight uh, and a man seeking his beloved, but it's about uh, a man who has to leave Cornwall. 
Um, the context has changed. And most importantly for us, the perspective has changed. So it's now a female perspective. Um, the, the narrator is a woman. And I would say that this is a kind of feminization going on there. Of course, the whole situation of corny songs looks far more complex than what I just showed. So we not only have broadside ballads, folk songs and corny songs, but we have ballad or folk carols um, and they are followed by what uh, Richard McGrady calls new Christian hymnody, basically church songs. There was a time where folk songs were not really sung anymore, uh, but church songs were far more po popular. And um, there is even a quotation by Cecil Sharp who complains that all the maids do not know any folk songs anymore, but they sing nothing but hymns. Uh, and if we look at that, um, in a way at what was popular at a certain time, we could certainly also say that hymns, Christian hymns, could be said to be a, or have been a kind of folk songs as well, because they were so popular to everybody. Um, folk songs is actually a new creation. Um, well, around 1900, this concept became very popular. Um, it's based on a German word, Volkslied that goes a bit further back, but it was taken up particularly by Cecil Sharp. And he imagined folk songs to be a bit like plants, uh, to come from the ground. Um, and he didn't want any um, authors there or, or any composers. It should be from the people, should develop a bit like uh, in an evolution theory, the ones that survive, they, they're carried on, the other ones are forgotten. And, and uh, he didn't like any uh, such sources as, for example, music hall um, hits that, of course, entered that repertoire as well. Music halls were quite big in urban centres such as London, and these hits, these songs, they travelled to the countryside and were taken up and got into that folk song repertoire. And also opera arias, some of them became very famous, um, and um, Cecil Sharp didn't really like this. But we have to always bear that in mind that opera, a so-called art music, musical hits and others always have an influence on the so-called folk songs. And then, of course, uh, especially in the Cornish context, we've got loads of um, compositions going on, starting from 1900 on with uh, compositions by Ralph Dunson, for instance, later on the English country, and then, of course, recently um, in the whole revival scene, there's a plethora of songs uh, and tunes that were written. And uh, very often also we find influences that came from outside Cornwall. So I put here Scottish, Irish, French, American, Breton, and we could go on with that list. So it's a quite complex situation. And I think that's what makes a Cornish song a Cornish song. Now, we've already talked a lot about the term revival, and uh, it's a complex term, uh, and I just want to give you a very, very brief definition. Revivals, music revivals, is a global phenomenon. They happen everywhere. And um, if you want to know more about it, I'd recommend you to read the Oxford Handbook of Music Revival, because it gives you um, the background of why uh, revivals evolve, how they evolve, and um, what happens to the repertoire, etc. So the only thing I'm going to give you here is a very brief definition by the Swedish ethnomusicologist Uwe Ronström, and he, get, he says the following. Revival is only partly about what once was. More importantly, it is about what is and what is to come. In essence, revival is a process of traditionalization that goes on in the present to create symbolic ties to the past for reasons of the future. So um, music revivals, they do not just happen like that. They always come with a certain uh, background, with a certain ambition also. And um, in the case of Cornwall, the music revival is closely linked to the language revival, which started around 1900. The music revival is probably a bit later. Um, but it's also connected to the Cornish cultural revival, which started around the, the turn of last century and which focused on Cornwall as being a Celtic nation, a nation on its own with Celtic uh, backgrounds because they've got the language, the, the Celtic language, which is 
closely are connected to Breton and Welsh, for those of you who don't know. And um, it was a, a way of, of um, detaching oneself from the big urban centres such as London, for instance, and to find one's own identity and a very attractive identity as well. And so the Cornish Music Revival is closely connected to this uh, movement. So what happens in a music revival? You've got various historical sources here from the 17th, 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. And then from that material, the revivalists pick what they like. Um, so a selection is going on. And then usually a transformation is going on because you, we don't know usually what these uh, songs sounded like in the 17th century. So of course you have to use your own imagination and creativity. And also you want to um, portray the songs in a way that other people are gonna like them. And so transformation is going on. And then what is important also for music revival is that that material which is being revived, that corpus of material has to be disseminated to a larger group of people. And so dissemination in form of uh, workshops, of music groups, publications, um, but of course also outputs, audio outputs, films um, and social media, for instance, they are very important. And uh, in the white box, you can find a lot of um, terms all starting off with re. This is a compilation of terms that uh, Juniper Hill and Caroline Bethel um, present in the introduction to their handbook of music revival. And I think three of them, the ones that I marked in red, are particularly interesting for our talk today. So reinterpretation of um, the source material, refocusing. Think about the shift we had from the male to the female perspective and also reinvention or recreation you could say. But of course the revived and new Cornish songs are not the only Cornish songs in Cornwall. So um, we've got also lots of shanties and pop songs going on that can be heard at the so-called shouts. So for instance uh, in a pub or outside where you've got usually men uh, standing together and singing, but as Hilary Coleman and Sally Burley showed in their presentation a couple of weeks ago, women are slowly creeping in there as well and singing. And then of course we've got the carols that uh, are not that popular anymore nowadays, only around Christmas, but then there's been um, a revival going on there as well. So uh, lots of interesting projects. And uh, I just chose to give two colors to these different types of Cornish songs. So the green ones are more for the revived and new Cornish songs that underwent that revival process. And shanties, pop songs and carols I marked in orange. And you'll see that when you go through the sources. So um, it's time for two examples. Let me give you two examples of the different kinds of songs. So here is an orange song, a song from the pop repertoire La Morna, um, sung by Port Isaac's Fisherman's Friends. It's a YouTube recording, they're going to introduce it and La Morna is a place in Cornwall. However, that song originally, well, comes from Manchester and was called Pomona at the time. And how it got to Cornwall, I don't know, but it's a very cool song nowadays. And it's about a woman. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's some popular songs in Cornwall that are used um, mainly around the pubs when everyone's had about 20 pints and is feeling violently sick and wants to get even over and done with. We generally then start to sing about half past 11 when the landlord wants us to go. Mm -hmm. This is the morning. Well, I'm just leaving already, looking at the accent. Very slowly, yeah. This song I'll sing to you about a Oh, 
Okay, so we have a real woman here, um, a fair maiden uh, with dark and rolling eyes. She's charming, she's a rover, she's a bit wild as well. Turns out she's actually the wife of the drunk narrator. And um, so that's one depiction of a woman and one depiction of a corny song. And now we've got a green song, a new corny song, Anvorvorna Zener, which means the mermaid of Zener. And um, it's performed here by Dalla in 2016. Uh, the music was written by Penny Knight and the words by Julian Holmes. Hilary's going to sing it in Cornish and Beck's going to give a translation. And for those of you who don't know, this is a famous story, a famous myth in Cornwall about a mermaid who lives in a place called Zener. Um, and she falls in love with a young man in the church and basically takes him down uh, to live with her under the sea. This is the very short version of it. <laughs> Sorry, I have to stop it here. So this is about this mermaid, a marvelous girl, a strange woman with eyes as bright as the stars in the night, uh, who lures Matthew Tarella in with silver, gold, and her heart. Uh, the text for this song in English is written uh, at the cover, at the inside um, of the album K5, which appeared in 2013 by Dala. So we have a very different type of song here. And uh, this brings me to the research questions um, for this presentation today. So my interest was, what female figures do appear in Cornish songs over the centuries? And then what songs depicting female figures were taken up during the Cornish revival, Cornish music revival, and how were they transformed, interpreted, or set into a new context? And the methodology I'm gonna apply today is I'm gonna list uh, songs featuring female figures through the centuries and now of course this is 300 years and this is a plethora of songs so I, I have to focus on the major collections and publications I have to limit myself there and then I will choose one uh, usually one but sometimes two examples of these collections and examine them a bit closer in that I do text analysis I will list the keywords in the yellow box and I will show you musical examples and we'll also show you the sources to these songs. So let us start um, with the late corner song texts. They were compiled and written towards the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century and we have five to seven late corner song texts. Uh, why do I not know that precisely? It's because sometimes it's clear that a text is a song, but because they all come without melody, uh, sometimes it's not sure whether this is a poem or just a riddle or whether it was originally a song. So uh, the sources we have are three different manuscripts. The oldest is by William Guavas, that is in the Bodleian Library in London late 17th century. Then we have one by Thomas Tonkin, that's in Cornwall. Must have been written after 1689 because that date is mentioned in the manuscript. 
And then we have a copy of that Thomas Tonkin manuscript by William Borlase, which is a bit later from the 1750s. Uh, so these are the sources, basically. And then also important, we have prints. Prints are obviously much easier to get access to. And three of them are important. They just reprint um, the, the content of these early manuscripts. So William Price's Archaeologica Corner Britannica of 1790 is a very important source. You can also find it online. Uh, Edward Jones, he's a Welshman, or he was a Welshman. He wrote uh, Musical and Poetical Relics of the Welsh Bards in 1794. And Richard Paul Wheel, a Cornishman, wrote the history of Cornwall in 1810. And they all contain bits and pieces of these late Cornish song texts. Now, I could identify three songs that somehow describe women or have got women as characters in them. Um, we're going to look at all three of them, but only one, the one that I marked in green, was actually taken up during the revival. Um, let's start with Malaya's Braga, which means the following. There are many wives, worse than grains, better left than taken. And there are many women like the bees. They will help bring men to get the wealth of the world. And then a bit later on in the second red box, speak to me, thou man so wise, to whom is much of wealth and much land. And I did hear the people complain that there is to thee a huge wife good. She knows to make cloth good with her wool, and she must hearth it. She ought to have fire. So obviously we have good women and bad women here. And the good women are diligent, supportive and caring. And of course, they're good at doing household things such as weaving and sewing. And I do think that this is originally a Cornish text because if you look at the uh, last words in the penultimate and the ultimate line in each stanza, they always rhyme throughout the whole text and they do not rhyme in English. So this is certainly a Cornish original song or verse, um, but it wasn't taken up during the revival. Um, don't know why. And then we have this one, Mekana Beva Hearn. I will sing of the pilcher by boat and nets, taken in the bay of the grey rock in the wood. Soon as the boats are come home from the sea, the man of the port tithe tithe cries. And every woman comes near her husband with her caval, that's a basket, and 300 pilchards to make bulks of fish in every house with their mouths crying or singing, much pilchard, pilchard, more salt. And uh, the song hasn't ta been taken up as such during the revival, but the topic has been. And also the phrase Holland Mui, more salt, was used um, as a title on the second album by Dalla, which appeared in 2003. And again, we have got um, diligent women here. They sing and they're very good at curing pilchards. And the one song that found its way into the revival and is nowadays very known, uh, I'm sure all of you, at least the ones who live in Cornwall, probably have heard it or sung it, um, is Pelea Eroi Moss. Whither are you going, pretty maid, he said, with your black head and your yellow golden hair. Going to the well, kind sir, she said, for strawberry leaves make babies fair. So we've got an encounter here between a young man and a young lady or a a girl rather um, and then the story goes on he tries to obviously seduce her somehow shall I go with you and she says yes if you please and then he what if I lay you down which basically means what if we make love but she says I rise again and what if I got you with child if what if you became pregnant I will have it she says who will you have to father your child? He asks, you shall be his father, she replies. So what have we got here? We've got a pretty girl. Um, she seems very kind, maybe a bit innocent, maybe even slightly naive uh, and very accepting. She's, she accepts everything that he does or suggests. And um, this is the Guavas manuscript that you see here. It's quite interesting because it, he always writes the first line of um, the stanza in Cornish and then beneath he writes the English translation. And um, 
what is very interesting in this version, there, there are also English versions of this uh, song around and Scottish versions and Irish versions, Welsh versions, American versions. And I've written about it, so I'm not going to go into too many details here. But what is interesting is in this version in the manuscript, the girl is described physically as having a black head. So a peden dao. And she's described as having yellow hair. And this black head has been interpreted um, as her having tanned skin from working outside. And um, if we go to the early prints, however, we find that this black head uh, changes. So in price, uh, we've got a betches quin, so a white face instead of black head. The yellow hair remains, so she's still blonde. Um, and also the same, the, the Betcheth Quinn we have got um, in Paul Wheel, which is the, the one at the, the bottom. Um, and he translates it as rosy white. So the face is rosy white and soft yellow hair. For me, most interesting is the middle source, which I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a bit blurred uh, by Edward Jones. Um, because this is a, a version that varies in certain words from the manuscript versions. It looks very Welsh as well. And instead of um, a pretty girl, we've got um, a Moss Vian here, a little girl. And she has got Alice takes. She's got rosy cheeks. And she's not going to the well, but she's going a milking, Haleth. And this resembles many of the English versions who usually have got um, uh, red rosy cheeks and black hair or black curly hair or not brown hair, even sometimes blonde hair. There's a Scottish version with blonde hair. So it's quite interesting how the physical appearance of this girl changes. And um, when Brenda Wooten, one of the big Cornish singers, uh, together with Benjamin Luxon, performed this song at a television show, which was called Not With Lowen, A Happy Night, uh, in 1980, broadcasted by Television Southwest, which doesn't work anymore, it's defunct nowadays, they chose the version Betcher Quinn, so the white face. And what I really like, and I hope you hear it, is the way that Brenda introduces um, this song. She doesn't see the girl only as innocent um, and kind, but she rather suggests that this girl might be quite flirting and tempting. It's going to be called Dalio City, which means the leaves of strawberries. Now, for centuries, strawberries and strawberry leaves have been associated with love potions and aphrodisiacs. And this song is no different. It's a very old traditional song. And Ben is a very amorous traveling tailor. And I'm a rather keen Cornish maid. <laughs> So we have the inter interpretation here, um, uh, which sees her as a rather keen Cornish maid. And uh, interesting also nowadays, when this song is being sung in Cornish, uh, what I heard usually is not the white face anymore, but it's rather the pedendao, the black head. Okay, now let's come, um, I will just see that some questions are coming up. Oh yes, that's, uh, that was Neil Daly <laughs> on the guitar. Uh, he's one of the band members of Dala, the one with the uh, ginger hair. Right, now we're going to come to the broadside ballads. Um, they also existed in Cornwall and uh, I had a look at which of these broadside ballads do actually mention any Cornish uh, place names or, or just Cornwall um, at all. And of the ones that I found, only one uh, ballad was about um, a woman. It's called A Wonderful Prophecy, declared by a maid of 20 years of age, late daughter to Daniel James, who was born and bred near the town, which is called Patstow, 
in the county of Cornwall, who departed this life upon the 8th of March. And the story goes like this. A damsel near Patstow, uh, a damsel did near Patstow duel within the county of Cornwall fair, whose parents had no child but her. She was her father's only heir. To whom came many brave young man, intending to make, make her a wife, but never tempting tongue could make this maid to change her maiden life. And though her parents riches had and costly garments are allowed, in homely habit she would go and always hated to be proud. So she's rich, she's wealthy, she's her father's only heir, she's chaste and she's modest. What a wonderful lady. Now the story goes on, I'm not gonna read it. I'm gonna let you listen to a recording by um, the English Broadside Ballad Archive located in Santa Barbara, USA. And there we go. She ne'er was heard to curse or swear, nor any word of anger give. But courteous was in everything to them that did about her live. If she heard anyone to swear or take God's sacred name in vain, she told them that they crucified our Savior Jesus Christ again. She often did frequent the church and also did relieve the poor. The widow and the fatherless she every day fed at the door. Upon a time this damsel she fell sick and in a deadly sound. She lay for twenty hours space. No life in her could then be found. Okay, so the story goes on. Everybody sits at her deathbed and bemoans her and cries. And then she becomes life again. And, and she gives a prophecy, uh, which if I summarize it very briefly, it's that all the good people will come to heaven and all the bad people will end up in hell. And uh, if you want to read it, go online, have a look um, at the web page that I've put there, and then you can see all the stanzas. And so you see this lady, uh, is wonderful. She doesn't swear. She's very courteous um, and she's a really devoted Christian, even so devoted that she missionizes. She goes around and, um, and educates people. And of course, she also helps the, the poor, the, the widow and the fatherless. Wonderful Christian. Um, this song wasn't taken up during the revival. Wonder why. Um, let us go to the ballad carols, also called folk carols. Um, it was Richard McGrady who um, calls them folk uh, carols because they are much more considered folk songs than actually church songs. And uh, the main collectors of these carols are obviously Davis Gilbert and William Sandys. Both of them had several uh, publications. And uh, because I couldn't go through all of that, I decided to focus on Richard McGrady's compilation, uh, Ancient Carols. In Cornwall and um, went just through them to see where women appear and uh, the ones where I could find a female figure are the ones that you have here so the ones by Davis Gilbert and also William Sandys and you can see that some of them are the same ones for example a virgin most poor um, or when righteous Joseph wedded was is the same as when righteous, righteous Joseph etc uh, and I'm going to show you uh, something about these carols here uh, in a minute, but you might already suspect that the, the woman, the woman described in most of these uh, folk carols is obviously um, Mother Mary. Um, and she's described a lot. And three of these uh, folk carols have been taken up in the revival. Those are the ones in green. However, interestingly, two of them were only taken up as instrumental versions and not with the words. So God's Dear Son without a beginning. Um, I'm just going to read the part that concerns Mary. No place at all for our Savior in Judea could be found. Yet sweet Mary's mild behavior patiently upon the ground. Her babe did place in vile disgrace where oxen in the stall did feed. No midwife mild had this sweet child, no woman's help at modest need. So we have Mary here 
um, especially in the role of a mother, the mother of Jesus. Uh, but also in other carols, you can find her as, of course, the virgin. She's sweet, um, she's got a mild behavior, she's patient, and she's poor. And uh, Richard McGrady writes, the role of Mary as mother of Christ, virgin and intercessor is central to many of the ballad carols. These echoes of an older Christian tradition, together with the intermingling of Christian and non-Christian symbolism, may well be the most important reason why both the Anglican and non-conformist churches distance themselves from the popular carols. The legends um, counting carols, for example, the Dilly song, and the emphasis on Mary disappeared from the new Christian hymnody. And equally, they play no part in the emerging industrial Cornish carol. So the, the, the figure of Mary, mother of Christ and virgin, is essential to the folk carols. The only other woman that also appears sometimes is Eve. And of course, she's the bad woman, the seducer, the one who eats from the apple and then tempts uh, Adam, Adam to do the same. But what happened to that, that song I just read you a part of, God's Dear Song Without Beginning? Well, it was taken up in the revival. It was taken up as an instrumental version um, by the group Bakka, which could be said to be really the beginning of the Cornish music revival. They published or you know, produced their, their LP, it was a long play at the time, uh, in 1976. And in that, on that recording, they renamed um, this tune. So it, it was renamed in Cornish, Andafunians, which means the awakening. So God's dear son, doesn't appear here anymore. Uh, we're going to listen to this instrumental version. On the right, you've got um, the score by Davy Stilbert. And I just put some circles around where you can hear variations in the recording. <laughs> should add here that the Cornish music revival is anyway kind of uh, can be defined as being as having had more emphasis on instrumental music especially at the beginning so there were not that many songs around at the beginning some of course they were and and they also wrote some new ones but it was principally uh, an instrumental tradition and then only uh, a bit later on on also um, with the um, with the coming up of the Nuslowin movement around 2000, the songs became more important again. Um, and now we'll hear um, a recording by Dala, one of the, these Nuslowin groups who did focus on songs, and it's it's also um, one of Gilbert's um, publications. It followed uh, the ballad carols. It's not actually a ballad carol. It's actually um, a broadside ballad. And you're going to listen to the first um, few phrases to, to hear the story. The Three Sisters. <laughs> Jennifer, 
So what we have here are three beautiful sisters and they're all really sensual and even sexual because one of them goes to bed with this knight. It's actually all about this wedding and they're also quite intelligent. They ask him a question which he has to answer to get them. And uh, in the CD um, of 2003, uh, in the booklet, um, the source or the tune is given as traditional Cornish. Um, but I assume that traditional is more meant as a kind of stylistic reference there because there is a, another source to this song which goes further back um, and which is a, a North Umbrian um, broadside ballad and uh, Sabine Beringold, one of the collectors in Cornwall, already mentioned this. So he writes, the ballad is given by Davis Gilbert in his supplement to some ancient Christmas carols in the west of England. It is a fragment in ten stanzas, but the story is precisely the same as the Northumbrian laid the bend to the Bogoni broom, which is in 23 stanzas. And I'd love to just play you a recording by Isla Cameroon. Um, sorry about the quality. Uh, it's, um, it was recorded in 1961. And you'll hear that before we come to the part that we just heard um, in Dallas version, there is a pre-story to that. And you'll also hear that the wording is going to be very, very similar, but the melody is a completely different one, which is very common with broadside ballads. There was a lady in the north country, lay the bend to the bunny broom. And she had lovely daughters three. Fa la 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 la. There was a knight of noble worth. Lay the bend to the bunny broom. A wife he did desire to have. Fa la 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 la. He knocked at this lady's gate, lay the bend to the bonny broom. One evening when it was late, fa la 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 la. The eldest sister let him in, lay the bend to the bonny broom, and closed the gate with a silver pin. Fa la 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 la. The second sister made his bed, lay the bend to the bonny broom, and placed soft pillows neath his head. Fa la 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 la. The youngest sister that same night, lay the bend to the bonny broom. She went to bed to that young knight. Fa la 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 la. So now we come to the first British folk revival. And um, I chose to call it not English folk revival because it, it's not English. It, it's, it happened in the whole of the British Isles, so it's a British folk revival. Um, and it can be said to have been started roughly in the 1880s and then just gone somewhere in between the wars. And in Cornwall, two people particularly were important. Uh, you see the most important ones here, but the ones underlined, Sabine Baringold and Ralph Dunstan can be said to have been very, very important. So uh, Sabine Baringold um, collected lots and lots of songs in Devon and Cornwall and published it in Songs and Ballads of the West. And Ralph Dunstan, we come to him a bit later, he also made two publications of Cornish songs. And so I went to, through all um, the songs that Sabine Baringold published in his Songs and Ballads of the West and checked whether it described women and um, if female characteristics were apparent there. Quite a lot of work, I'll tell you. <laughs> and so the one, the songs that you you see that they've got a red star, they all describe female characters somehow. And the one songs that have got a blue star, they were taken up in the Cornish music revival. And this, the three songs that are encircled or have got um, a green square about them, they were collected in Cornwall by Seven Baron Gould. 
Now you'll see there are some of the songs that were revived in the Cornish Music Revival, but were not collected by Barry Gold in Cornwall. And that's because some of these songs were later again collected, for example, by English Gundry in Cornwall. And so they were kind of legitimized to have been taken up um, in the revival. But of all these songs, there is only one song that has been uh, collected in Cornwall, that has been taken up uh, in the revival and that deals with a woman, and that's the Sweet Nightingale, which I'm sure all Cornish people are familiar with. So I'm not going to play it at the moment. I'll show you a different version after. It's again an encounter between a young man and a young lady, and he tries to seduce her. She doesn't want at the beginning. She says, pray, let me alone. I have hands on of, of my own. Along with you, sir, I'll not go. For to hear the front tale of the sweet nightingale as she sings in the valley below. Um, but at the end, they do get married. And um, this song seems to be quite innocent, um, but it's important, I guess, to know that the nightingale is not just a little nice um, singing bird, but it's actually a euphemism for making love. So the girl, of course, has to lose a lot here. She's not married and um, she goes with that young man. And it's interesting that um, in the version that, um, what was his first name? Sorry. Robert, Robert, Robert Bell, uh, published in 1857, the stanza actually continues. So we've got, pray let me alone, I've got hands of my own, along with you I'll not go, to hear the fond tale of the sweet nightingale as she sings in those valleys below, for I'm afraid to walk in the shade, to walk in those valleys below, to walk in those valleys below. So she, tell, she gives him a reason of why she doesn't want to go with him, because she's afraid of losing her honour. And that part um, is not found anymore in the version that Baron Gould um, collected, and it's not heard nowadays. But a little bit of it remains in the last stanza. So we've got here the couple agreed to be married with speed, and soon to the church they did go. Never more she's afraid for to walk in the shade, or to sit in these valleys below. And Robert Bell, uh, who printed this song in 1857, writes an ancient Cornish song. This curious ditty, which may be con confidently assigned to the 17th century, is said to be a translation from the ancient Cornish tongue. We first heard it in Germany in the pleasure gardens of the Marienberg on the Moselle. The singers were four Cornish miners who were at that time, 1854, employed at some lead mines near the town of Zell. The, lead, the leader, or captain, John Stocker, said that the song was an established favourite with the lead miners of Cornwall and Devonshire and, that, um, and was always sung on the paydays and at the wakes, and that his grandfather, who died 30 years before at the age of 100 years, used to sing the song and say that it was very old. And now, of course, um, this context, this description that Bell gives here um, is very attractive for Cornish musicians nowadays. And so the temptation to translate this song into Cornish is, of course, very great. <laughs> so you'll hear now um, the Maid Ladies Choir with a performance of 2018 where they sing this song in Cornish, Eos Hueg. translation to Cornish sounds very nice, um, but I think it's a bit an over-romanticization probably, because if you read um, what Baringold has to say about this song, um, a little bit of deconstruction is going on there. So he says, I've traced that song um, to Bickerstaff's Thomas and Sally, 1760, a ballad opera 
the music by Dr. Arn. The Cornish melody is, however, quite distinct from that by Arn. The same duet is in The Siren. This was a collection, a compilation of folk song texts, London, not dated, but about 1770. The words doubtless traveled down into Cornwall in some such a collection as The Siren and were there set to music by some local genius. It is no later than the middle of the, of the last, which is the 18th century. And of course, I was interested in this uh, ballad opera, Thomas and Sally, and I, I did find this duet. It's called Well Met, and I'm sure you'll catch some of the phrases which are very similar to the text that I showed you before. Well met, Whatever the origin, nowadays, of course, Sweet Nightingale is a very, very Cornish song and is enjoyed by many Cornish people. And now we come to Ralph Dunstan. Ralph Dunstan was a Cornish man himself. He was um, a musicologist, um, a composer as well. And uh, he published two books, the Cornish Songbook um, and the Cornish Dialect and Folk Songs book. And um, if you see the colors that I put here, of course, we've got many that belong nowadays to that orange uh, group of songs. So they write pop songs or carols um, that can be heard. But what is very interesting for me, also the, the purple song is the one we've already spoken about, Pray With Us So Trippingly, which is the same as Del Sevi, Del Sevi, where are you going to that manuscript one? Um, but for me, it's important or interesting that especially at that time when the Cornish cultural and language revival started, so early 1900s, um, a new song type, a new female type in songs seems to become popular. And that's the mermaid. Couldn't find any other songs before then who mentioned a mermaid in Cornwall. And the mermaid here um, goes as following. On one Friday morning, we set sail. And when not far from land, we all espied a fair merry maid with a comb and a glass in her hand. Then up starts the captain of our gallant ship, and a brave young man was he. I've a wife and daughters in Verelsen town, but I fear they'll be weeping for me. And then the next one comes and he says, oh, I have a wife in fair Patstall town. And the third one says, oh, I have a sweetheart in fair Lansen town. Then three times round went our gallant ship, and three times round went she. For the want of a longboat, we all went down and sank to the bottom of the sea. So we've got this mermaid here, who's a beautiful creature. She's vain as well. She's got a comb and a glass in her hand. She's mythical. She's seductive. She's also destructive. And finally, she's deadly. Ralph Dunstan writes about this song. The mermaid, or merry maid, has haunted the shores of old Cornwall from the time immemorial and lured many a Cornish sailor and fisherman to a watery grave. The following song embodies many Cornish traditions and several of the stanzas are Cornish variants. Mr. Tregarthen, who is the greatest living authority on mermaids, seals or soils, um, says that this is undoubtedly a song of Cornish origin. 
at any rate so far as the words are concerned. And I'm afraid Mr. Tregarthen didn't know that there is a broadside ballad which is older than um, the version that Dunstan gives us. It's called The Mermaid and here you've got a print uh, from Birmingham. So I've got uh, a message here, just a second. I remember singing The Mermaid in primary school around 1959. I lived in Exeter then. Oh, that's nice to know. Thank you so much for this comment. Exciting. So uh, I wonder what the version was in Exeter because probably these uh, Cornish towns were not there. Uh, and here in the Birmingham version, we've got Portsmouth and we've got uh, London Town as place names. So let's see if we got an answer from the Exeter person. Oh, Fred Francis, we also sang it at school with the English towns. How interesting. Yes, yeah, sea shanties were adapted whenever they went. It's certainly not unique to Cornwall. Essex near London. Oh, so exciting. Well, I think, yeah, it was probably not uh, unique to Cornwall, but it was important enough for Dunstan to take it to this compilation. And um, it's also interesting that the mermaid kind of stuck as a, an important female figure uh, through the following um, um, development of the revival. So, for, for instance, Brenda Wooten composed a song, The Mermaid, which is a different um, story, has got a different text, of course. And it's also sung from the perspective of the mermaid herself. And it's about um, this mermaid of Zener. And um, I'll just let you some of the recording play so you can see um, how she describes the mermaid. Oh yeah, it takes a while till it starts. And then goes on, green are my eyes as the waters of the ocean, red my hair, my pretty boy, white my breasts upon the wave, and I will give to thee my pretty, uh, all I will give to thee my pretty boy, soft are my arms, soft are my lips. And uh, as Hilary just mentioned, thank you so much, Hilary. Um, the song is sung by Brenda Wooden, but of course it was Richard Gendel or Dick Gendel who wrote um, the song um, because they had a very, very close collaboration obviously going on. So the, the female character depicted here is mythical, seductive, destructive, deadly, but she's also beautiful. She has green eyes, red hair, white breasts, soft arms and lips. And um, as you remember at the beginning, I showed you uh, another version of, uh, um, uh, well, another song on the Mermaid of Zener as written and performed by Dalla. And so the mermaid really became one of these important uh, female figures during the Cornish music revival. And then this is quite interesting. Uh, and a lot of thanks um, goes here to Sue Ellery Hill, the daughter of Brenda Wooten. She contacted me uh, some weeks ago and she sent me this very interesting song, which um, was written by um, a man called Herbert Thomas and his daughter, Ilva Thomas. And, and it's inside a little booklet, Pasties and Cream, New Cornish Song. And of course I had to take this for this presentation. So I'm gonna read out the text um, and you just um, check the, the words in the yellow box. We are the women of Cornwall, cradled between the seas 
proudly we stand in our Cornish land, braced by the ocean breeze. All that we have we hold in trust, all that we love we prize. Long as we live we serve and love with a faith that never dies. We are the women of Cornwall, born of the storm and sun, mothers who pray and wives who toil till the last day's work is done. We are the women of Cornwall, one with the moorland wide, one with the bloom of firs and broom, one with the wind and tide. Scent and colour and song we love, storm and danger we dare, cradle our babes in mothering arms and shield our men with prayer. We are the women of Cornwall, mothers of exiles dear, sweethearts and wives whose blithed lives heed not the shadow of fear, ours to love and serve and pray that our men may safe return, our eyes shall light them like the stars and our home fires brightly burn. So here we have uh, women who are proud of their, of their land of Cornwall and they're very much connected to nature. They love to sing, they're afraid of storms, but um, very importantly, they are good mothers, they're devoted wives uh, and they, they love, they serve, they pray, they're good Christians and they also take really good care of their husbands. So I found this a very interesting description. Unfortunately, couldn't find a date. Uh, this is something which I still have to, to find out. Maybe Sue can tell us a bit more at the end. Um, and another song which was written by, uh, oh, what was his name? Sorry, Herbert Thomas, is Trifina Treneri. And this is another description of a Cornish woman. And I'll just let Brenda sing about her here. Oh, Trifina Trenary, you're so brown as a berry, as handsome and bright as a new copper pan. You are fit to lead off the first dance at the furry, and to have as your partner a rich older man. But Trifina, there's something that's better than riches. Tis the love that will last like the patterns you wear. Tis the arm that will hack out the tin from the pitches And the hand that will help me to drive away care Oh, try Fina Trenary, so brown as a berry I'd swap all I own for a wink of your eye I'll help turn the mangle and never will wrangle If you will be mine in the sweet by and by so what we have here is a real woman, a worker, brown as a berry, reminds me Delphi Sevi with the pet and dow. <clears throat> she's handsome, she's bright as a new copper pan, what a nice comparison. <laughs> and uh, she's the leader of the furry, for those of you who don't know, the furry is um, a processional dance, which is danced once a year on the 8th of May in Helston, a little town in Cornwall um, and it's a great honour of course if you can lead that dance. Uh, she's a jolly good woman, she's a real woman and I kind of see Trifina Treneri um, as another archetype of um, Cornish female characters in, in the Cornish revival repertoire. Um, women who really stand on the ground, who are you know uh, busy and, and working and um, these women, for example, in one or another form, are closely connected to um, the, the the role of the ball maidens, so the women who worked on the surface of the mines. And we have two songs here, one written by Richard Trisubi and one written by Hilary Coleman, who talk about these women. And uh, as you can see, lots of their characteristics resemble that, that archetype of Trafina Treneri. So here is um, The Flower of St. Day by Richard Trithuvi. I'll tell to you a story and I'll only tell what's true About a pretty bell maiden who didn't have a clue He got her into trouble and she couldn't work out why She was the talk of Cornwall, the subject of their lies So skip it away your bell maid, skip it away your time Skip it away your time, singing diddly arm a doodle lies. Skip it away your bow, mate. Skip it away your time. But listen to this song, for it's no lie. So why do work with Prissy? And I know her well indeed. She does the work of two girls and does it with such speed. 
She has arms like granites and legs like trees that say, but I'll be friends with Chrissy for forever and a day. So skip it away, your ballet, skip it away, your time, skip it away, your time, singing diddly arm a doodle lies, skip it away, your ballet, skip it away, your time, but listen to this song for it's no lie. Now some days I look at Chrissy and on her chin I see some hair, but look at her the next day, there's nothing even there. And in her Sunday best, she's as handsome as she's tall. She'd beat the boys at wrestling and beat the men and all. So skip it away, your ballmate, skip it away, your time. Skip it away, your time, singing diddly arm a doodle lies. Skip it away, your ballmate, skip it away, your time. But listen to this song, for it's no lie. And now we'll hear uh, the Ball Maidens chant here sung by the Red River Singers, of, of whom I'm sure many might be listening today. So this is a performance of 2013 in Heartlands. The song was written by Hilary Coleman. <laughs> They were hard working, they were really busy, uh, diligent, strong, and as um, it says here, they can work like a man. And so I kind of see that this is the, the second Cornish uh, archetype um, um, of Cornish songs, female songs. Now we come to the compilation by Inglis Gundry, uh, which appeared in 1966, Cano Kernel. And interestingly, he always writes each of the songs. Uh, first, the first line is in English, and then he translates it, or somebody translates it, to Cornish. And um, the purple songs we've already looked at. And you can see that there are some uh, of the green songs that were collected at the time by Baringold in Devon, but that were recollected again by Inglis Gundry in Cornwall. So, of course, they were taken up for the Cornish revival as well. And there are also some orange uh, songs, which kind of enters more the, the shout repertoire. And the one song I'd love to show you here are the Cornish girls. We've got now the female figures in the title. And I've heard this song recently uh, in pubs. So it's, it's really um, a song that at least has been revived and is now living culture. Um, come take a walk through Cornwall and there you'll find the sweetest and the neatest girls, the best of womankind. They're comely in their features and decent in their taste, modest in their behavior and slender in their waist. Success to all, to you all Cornish girls, all modest, neat and true. There are no girls in England to be compared with you. So Cornish girls, you know what you have to be like now. Here's a recipe, sweet, neat, pretty, modest, slender and true. And um, the only source that um, Gondry gives here that he's collected it from a Arthur Pascoe who remembered it um, and it was sung in, in, in St. Neot about 70 years before he published, so he published in 1966. And um, well, I do think this is a, a corn that must have been written by a Cornish man in Cornwall, a Cornish woman maybe um, in Cornwall. So now we just come towards the end of the talk. Um, we come to the revival. And uh, as I said, the first part of the revival from the 1980s, more or less to 2000, they were basically, that was basically a more instrumental uh, revival of Cornish music. But of course, there is also a publication that contains a lot of songs, which is Hengen by Murph Davy. It appeared the first time in 1983 and again uh, with a second edition in 2013. You've got some purple songs that we've looked at or heard, listened to. We've got some orange songs 
some of them were also um, discussed in the talk that Sally and Hillary gave, Little Eyes, I think, The White Rose. And then we've got some green songs, um, Flowers and Weeds, which were translated to Cornish when have legend now and were fused with some melodies. And that's a different story. I don't have the time to go into all of them. Um, but I'm going to focus on Tansis Galawen, The Midsummer Feast. The text was printed by Robert Bell, the one that we had the Sweet Nightingale before, and James Henry Dixon. And there was no music to go with this text. So Murph Davy uh, took the, the melody of the Marigold in the version that Baring Gold collected in Devon. The text goes as following. We're mostly interested in the text today, aren't we? So as I walked out to yonder green one evening so clear, all where the fair maids may be seen playing at the bonfire. Hey, lovely maids, be not too coy, but freely yield your charms. Let love inspire with mirth and, and joy in Cupid's lovely arms. Bright Luna spreads its light around the scene for to admire as they jump sporting or flames about the keen bonfire. So what we have here are girls that are fair and young, but especially they are wild, they're full of energy. They're also sensual, they're sexual, they're active, they're sportive. And this was, um, I think, is an image that fits very well. The wild uh, midsummer festivals that were revived as well, um, where you jump over bonfires, etc. And um, as I said, the tune that goes with this um, that Merv Davy chose is the tune of Marigold. Um, but I guess most of you might know this title, Tansis Galaun, from a different tune, an instrumental tune written by um, John Mills, uh, which is in 5 fourth and is being played in pubs very often. But I'm not going to show you an example now because we're not dealing with uh, textless music. Um, and then we come to the North Slowing movement that I mentioned several times, starting in around 2000, going on until today. Of course, the other movement also goes on until today, and uh, there are overlaps. And uh, what I found interesting is when I went through the whole compilation of, the, uh, of albums that the group Dalla produced, which is like a bit maybe the main source of North Slowing music, um, I found there were so many songs about female characters and not just side characters, but like actually uh, protagonists. And um, we've looked at the Junka Gurno, we've heard the ball maidens chant, and we've also heard Avavorna Zenner, the ones in purple. And there are many green ones, some of them are orange because um, they were also interpreted in earlier versions in English. Um, and are usually tied um, to the broadside ballads. Um, a song that I find interesting and want to find out more about is this one, Estren. I know a lot about Estren, it means the stranger. It also comes from a broadside ballad. But then Hilary Coleman composed the second part to it, New World. And while Estren is written from a male perspective about a stranger that comes home um, from America, back home to Britain. Um, the New World is written from the female perspective. And the example I chose from this uh, plethora of uh, female songs here is Mary's Waltz. And uh, the tune was written by Neil Davy and the text by Annie Murphy. And the whole song was commissioned by um, Beck Appleby and I'll let her introduce this song. This is about a real um, female protagonist. We're going to change the mood slightly and um, we're going to do a waltz now. Um, this um, is a lovely tune that was written or commissioned, commissioned it by, by Neil called Mary's Waltz um, and it's used in a, I do a one woman show based on a, a character, um, a live character. This is a true story of um, Mary Bryant. She was an amazing woman, a uh, young woman. She was a high, um, Cornish highway robber. Um, she stole a bonnet and was sent out to Australia and uh, she escaped with her family and several others in a in a small um, boat and they traveled around from Botany Bay right to East Timor. It's the most extraordinary story. Goes on, she she um, she lived in freedom for about three months and then was recalled to be brought back to England to be hanged for the second time and on the way back she lost all her family. 
Um, however, so this is just a taste. This is some of the words written by Anna Murphy. Um, and you have to imagine that you're by the sea. Now skip a bit. So we come to the text. My name's Mary. Mary Bright. I get air like a storm. Gorsebush got more style than me. I blame the hair for all my troubles, for the loss of everything that I ever loved. I stole a bonnet sea to cover in. Starchy white with lacy bits. I just had to have it. And I made too much of a show of myself parading up and down. And I got caught, clapped in irons, charged with violent highway robbery. I was to be hanged by the neck until dead. My sentence, it got changed. And I was sent to the other side of the world to work my fingers to the bone in His Majesty's colonies. And the story goes on, but we have to come to a conclusion. So what did I conclude from that plethora of songs I've analyzed? Well, female figures in the revived or new Cornish songs, for me, they are the following. We've got active protagonists here, not just beautiful girls that one might uh, encounter when one comes home, for example. But they're actually uh, telling a story and they're in the center of attention. We've got that uh, Trifina Trinary type, the ball maidens, strong, diligent, busy. They can work like a man. They're lively, they're jolly, happy, real. And on the other hand, we've got the mermaids or the more mysterious ca characters. I put witches here. Uh, the more mysterious, sensual, seductive, beautiful ones, the otherworldly ones which for me belong much more in that, uh, into that Celtic image um, of, of, of characters, which was very important for the Cornish music revival as well. And then we've got the heroines like Mary Bryant that we just listened to, or um, the woman who sings uh, the Nyunga Gurno at the beginning. Women who take their own decisions, who master their lives, who are strong. So which female figures do we not have in the revived or new Cornish songs, but that were actually um, sung in Cornwall once upon a time? We don't really have uh, songs about good Christians and certainly not about Christians who missionize. We don't really have biblical figures unless we look towards um, the orange songs, the carols that are sung around Christmas, of course. Um, we don't have or maybe I'm mistaken, but I couldn't find any song that um, talked about a serving woman, a woman who serves her husband or her father. And I couldn't find any song that talked about a victim, a woman that had been betrayed or had been left pregnant and became a shame to society. So what does this tell us about the Cornish music revival and the songs, uh, the female figures in the songs? Well, let's remember that revival is only partly about what once was and more importantly about what is and what is to come. So what is and what is to come? In my opinion, it's the following ones. Female agency has become very important in Cornwall, not only within the songs, but also um, around the music scene. Female creativity, for instance, there are so many projects bands, um, but also theater productions and dance, um, which have become, well, which, which were created uh, mainly by women and um, which became very popular and are important nowadays. Think of the whole um, chain dances that Nos Lewin has, for, for instance. Female sensuality can be talked about and is not a shame. Female strength is foregrounded. And female leadership is a very, very important, not least in the project that I'm presenting here, uh, which is about the women um, doing research about other women in the Cornish music, past and present. And so we've got female singers, female researchers, and female projects. And um, uh, so I hope it's good.
going into that direction carries on. I encourage everybody to do so. And now I'm really curious for your questions. And thanks for listening, for your patience. Thank you so much, Leah. What a great note to end on with our project. Um, yeah, as Leah said, any questions, do put them in with the chat or the Q&A. Hilary, I don't know if you've got any questions for Leah to start off. Um, yeah, I, I just uh, really can you. I have um, I have started my video, but it doesn't matter if you can't see me again. Can you hear me okay? I yeah, can. I'd love to see you. Um, I'll stop my presentation. Ah, okay. Maybe. Yes, <laughs> on here. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Leah. That was absolutely wonderful. I really enjoyed that, um, and I think that you've really, you know, I've so been aware that when we've revived. Uh, we we really want to find something, you know, um, and therefore we look for what we want rather than necessarily what is there. Um, and although I knew, I mean, I, I've actually got some information, like like about the Denium Cagerno, which I got from Anthony Snell. So um, I can pass that on to you. Yes, but, please. Um, so you've got a little bit more of your thread for that first song. But um, the. Um, you know, things like, it's really interesting, the whole thing about um, the mermaid song and um, how, I think it's really important that we don't go, this is definitely Cornish and we, it belongs to us. What, what we're, what we're, certainly with like with the Red River Singers, we sing that Cornish version because we live in Cornwall. That doesn't mean to say that there are these other versions that, and, and I grew up singing one, the, 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 the version I knew of the mermaid was all about Bristol and places like that. But when I found that one in Dunstan, which had the Cornish word, I was like, yeah, great, let's sing that one. Why not? We're in Cornwall. So I think it doesn't matter in a way what you do <laughs> with the tradition, as long as you're you're not trying to be deceitful and, and you can be open and honest about your sources, really. So um, that was that was not really a question. Sorry, Leah, but that was <laughs> just my comment. No, I, I completely agree. And um, I also find it interesting because I had a lot, uh, a look at a lot of different revivals globally. And uh, this process of selection and reinterpretation happens everywhere. Um, you know, like in Switzerland, for instance, uh, the Alphorn was just one of the many instruments that were around, but it was stylized and became a national symbol. And now it's obviously Swiss. Um, it's, it's something we do because uh, it matters for us. It matters to us and it matters to our identity. And, uh, and I think it's lovely um, the way uh, this happens. Um, the other thing I just thought was brilliant. Well, not brilliant, but fascinating was that I hadn't really clocked, it's, it's very obvious really, but I hadn't clocked that the, you know, the in the revival, obviously there was so much more uh, songs about women. We, we chose the ones we found to do with women or, you know, wrote ones. And um, obviously that's because we are women. <laughs> it's kind of funny anyway, you know, it's really obvious that that's what I'd be looking for, for mm -hmm. too late. You know, and so that was, yeah. That, yeah, that was I, think, that. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I wrote the paper, but I didn't want to present on that today. Um, I think that the Cornish music revival kind of, when Nos Lowen started around 2000, it became more female because there are some protagonists, I mean, yourself, but also Francis uh, Bennett and, um, and also uh, Karen Lockley Brown, or yeah you know, women who were protagonists also in creating. And of course you look for what you're interested in then. So for me, that Nosloan movement is, is closely connected also to a, a female direction in a way. Yeah, we, I don't know if, if anybody else got any questions. I've, I've we've, got had, um, we've got a hand up from Daniel. Daniel, if I click unmute, you should be able now to, we should be able to hear you. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, Hillary, kind of slightly uh, answered my question for me already, actually, but I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase. Um, Leah, from um, a researcher's perspective, is it obvious how women have been involved in the Cornish revival? For example, in comparison to maybe other revivals where we haven't got such a strong female character that has come out of these songs? Hmm. Well, um, then I would have to know all the other revivals, I think, to answer this question, you know, like seriously. Uh, I don't. Um, 
So I can actually just talk about this case study. I would have to look at other revivals and see whether, but I could imagine that this is maybe also a bit a general direction um, because of course our society, at least within the Western world, whatever that is, is going into a more female direction, into a more inclusive direction, hopefully at least. Um, so this could be the case, but I, I couldn't say yes or no here. Sure. That seems to make a lot of sense. I think you probably would find, uh, you know, um, I mean, I know like in terms of revival, in, in terms of just the instrumental uh, revival, the sessions where, where you, you know, you get a lot of instruments in a pub playing together. Um, it used to be very much very male based and now all over Britain, it would be, there's a much stronger female uh, role in that role in that too. So I just think it is a, a general trend in our society, which yeah. is very good. <laughs> see, Sue's just said something. Yeah. Ah, yes, you. you, you. Sue Ellery Sue Hill is part of our research team, and mm -hmm. she's been researching these women from the. Um, it was the. Um, I think it, she's looking at some of the earlier women from 1700s, the 1800s. I don't know what she was going to say. Was you going to say something, Sue? Um, do you want me to? I'll read out the question because I'm not okay. sure if everyone can see it. Um, Sue's asked, I'm researching the earlier period at the moment, the ladies of the aristocracy in the 18th and 19th century. I'm curious if there would have been women who would have been singing these old broadside ballads and what sort of social class they would have been. Yeah, I, I can't answer this uh, question because I'm not a specialist in broadside ballads, but I'm sure there are many and I would um, direct you towards the English Folk song, uh, folk Dance and Song Society because there are some excellent experts there on broadside ballads. I have a feeling that this was rather a male domain as well, but I, I wouldn't want to to uh, st state this because I haven't researched it. So my, my research area is basically the revival and all that comes before, um, I'm kind of trying and diving, but I'm not a specialist. Um, Mike O'Connor might know also because he's done more research um, in historical music in Cornwall. So he might know more. I don't know if he's uh, specialized in ballad carols though. Thank you. We've had another hand up from Frankie, if I uh, allow Frankie to speak. Uh, can you hear me? I'm not sure. If... Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I can now, apparently. Yes, just to, to say, obviously, some of us were, I, I guess we weren't so bothered about where the song came from. I'm talking about the 70s and the 80s, those of us who really became known and passionate about finding songs that illuminated women's lives. I, you know, uh, Peggy Seeger and Sandra Kerr and Maddie Pryor, there were a whole bunch of us back then in the early days of the second women's feminist revival. And so it was just a matter of getting excited whether they came from Scotland or Ireland or Cornwall or Newcastle. So it's just, you know, it's great to see the, because the, the 90s went into the doldrums in the early 80s as far as women's issues and cultural issues. So it's just great to hear that there's, you know, a very specific revival going on both about women and about the, the link to Cornwall. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you Frankie. Frankie. Um, I just, uh, I'm really, it's lovely that you were listening today. Um, I, um, you were one of the people who've inspired me in, into my traditional singing. Um, and you actually came and did a workshop for us. Well, I was mm -hmm. lovely, so lovely to have you on board. Thank you. That was Hillary. Yeah. <laughs> That was me, Hillary. Sorry. <laughs> Mysterious, isn't it, on Zoom? For all of us. Um, sorry. Um, could, could I just say something else? Or is there another question? Uh, uh, no, yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, all it was was um, when we were doing our research, Leah, um, you, you touched upon this idea that, uh, no, who was it? It was it got kind of like this, this string of uh, re, uh, collective researchers 
from Davies Gilbert onwards, and each one of them sort of threw out what they didn't consider to be the right. Yeah. Yes. So, so Davies Gilbert threw out the sort of industrial carols in favour of the folk carols, yeah. and then Festival yeah. Sharp and Bering Gould threw out ones that decided that sounded far too, you know, well, either rude yes. <laughs> or or um, or were too. I mean, in a way, they especially Bering Gould was looking for sort of more pagany things. So, you know, like that Marigold song, the Chances Galloan one, he kind of go harks harks back to this kind of women jumping over bonfires in a you know, sort of pagany. Uh, what was it? There's a period, wasn't it, where they they really got into that kind of thing, and now we're like, no, we can't sing songs about too. They can't be too Christian. They can't be too much about God and you know Virgin Mary, like you were saying. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm fascinated by the Sankey hymns, and you, you mentioned that they were they they came into the folk canon, and I th I believe that is they were very strongly part of the Cornish folk canon. You know, of today, they still are. Um, yeah. And um, and I feel like sometimes we throw the baby out with the bathwater because we're trying to find this, you know, the Celtic Celticity of our country instead of looking at the whole of it. But yeah, so and I I know I'm part of all that. I I want us to find loads of songs about women. So you know that's what I'd, you know I, we. I find it I find it interesting and it just uh, enriches the whole culture a lot. I mean, what had happened if we only had focused on pop songs? It would have been completely different, and so much would be missing. And um, what you just said before about Cecil Sharp and uh, how the texts obviously were made uh, less sexual so that they could be printed in school books, etc. Uh, yeah, as I said, this is a process that goes on in every revival. And I think the Cornish music revival builds up upon the first British folk revival, the second British folk revival, and then the other Celtic revivals that surrounded Cornwall. And um, there is a researcher, I can't remember her name now, but she talks about revival currents. And I think that's such a fitting term because it's like waves that come and go and it builds up on each other. And then an Oslowan wave comes and then another wave comes. And that's just uh, how culture evolves and how it's created. I, I like the allusion to waves. Um, and Karen Lockley Brown actually used the word second wave on uh, as her title for her dance projects. Which is kind of nice. Uh, yeah, I like that. I think we have to keep remembering that more waves will come. <laughs> I, I hope they will. <laughs> yes. Sorry, sorry. There are some mentions, isn't there, in the chat? Um, to Ellery Hill, we talked about about Lamorna, um, and it, the Brenda believes it was brought down to Cornwall by the writer Charles Lee, and she thinks he met him in the 1950s. And certainly in our research of the Lamorna in the songbook, it goes way back. It was actually, we reckon it might have come at the turn of the 20th century, even, even though it, it may have come from Manchester, it's probably been known in Cornwall for about 100 years. Yeah. So I think that constitutes a folk song. <laughs> and it's a there is a very good homepage uh, which of course I can't uh, type it in now uh, I would have to look it up again but about La Morna and it goes back all, uh, to Manchester but also to America because there is another turn there um, no. and it just gives a lot of in interesting um, sources to this song yeah but I think that's the nice thing with folk songs for me they do not know any borders they just cross they just go everywhere and they transform and i love that oh right well, yeah so so Ellery hill says there are pomona mines in america so that's that was the connection um, and i presume so sheila has said that uh mike connor's got a page about his ballad carols in his ilocano book so if yeah. anybody wants to find more about those. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, Michael Connor would certainly be a person to to ask questions like that because he's he knows a lot about it. Yeah, so, yeah, we've look, she is in contact with him, so that is good. Yeah, we've got so any more questions? Probably got time for one more question before we all go and have some lunch. <laughs> Oh, we've got a hand up, Francis. That's me. That's Can you. you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
it just occurred to me when you mentioned at the beginning, Lee, I really like that image of the word folk when you were talking about the folks lead and how it was as if it had uh, almost grown up from the ground. And then it also occurred to me that the Bering Gould songbook is the flowers of the West. And we're talking kind of about who picks what, you know, we're all wandering about and we go, oh, that's really nice. I'll have a bit of that one. And we're kind of like, like the currents is another image. I just really like that. that, that and it's a mistake to think that people randomly pick and it's a mistake to think that things grow without anybody doing anything about it because we do intervene, don't we? And I just, I quite like that, that, that quite reductive um, type of quote from the beginning, that it's, it's sort of, with all the examples you've been giving, it made me think of, you know, this far more encompassing and inclusive sort of image. I, I really like this image. This is amazing. I haven't thought it that far, Francis, but I think we should keep it in that in that sense. It's it's amazing how flowers grow in a garden. Yes, mm -hmm. of course. You need somebody trimming them and, and showing them in yeah. what direction they go. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That that's really I that's a great image. And it makes me think about, you know, some of the things sometimes we get really frustrated in Cornwall because um there is uh, you know, we Baron Gould was kind of the only collector that that was in Cornwall, you know, uh, collecting songs from Cornwall, and he lived in Devon. And I always felt like there was uh, some we were missing some, you know, somebody who took some notice. And that's a really good point because often people say, "Oh, there aren't any songs, or oh, there aren't any dunes in Cornwall." And it's like, well, partly because nobody was tending them, you know. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. said in the garden, if somebody, if there had been somebody who was vastly interested a hundred or so years ago we may have a lot you know more than that sorry back to you know um that period of time anyway we we may have more other than and it doesn't mean that it didn't exist it's just it, whether or someone wants to collect it you know so um, yeah, that's why at the, at the beginning when i showed all these different sources that kind of feed into the cornish songs i had uh one square which was very uh not with a sharp color but very blurred and it just said other sources because we don't know mm. but there might be and then once upon a time sometimes something pops up um i have no clue we can't know because we there are if there are no notes from the past we just don't know but i mean just like you said you know that one that i song dean young kagerno which is actually the um the what was it called the cornish young man um is in a somerset collection so you know you, you wouldn't you might not think to look there you know that 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 sort of thing happens a lot doesn't it where it may be in another collection or another yeah. place and it doesn't only appear there it appears actually in in a lot of other collections but with different melodies but similar texts and so that's why i really like this system of numbering the song complexes with these route numbers i find that quite quite a good system without you know uh, choosing one title over the other but just giving them a number and uh, I find it also good for doing research because you can actually do it from home. Just type it in that uh, online archive and you're surprised how much you're going to find there. It's amazing. We very much need at the moment. <laughs> Brings us back to uh, where we are, which is doing our research online. Yeah. We've got Barbara has just put a hand up. Last one from Barbara. Mm. Uh... Hello, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Hello. Hello, Leah. Thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful talk this morning. So many fascinating ideas. It's lovely to hear everybody. I just wanted to put my pennies worth in, which is another source that we've sort of stumbled over recently, is the collections or the selections that women in Cornwall made when they were compiling their learning books. And I'm talking about sort of 1740, 1750, the, the tunes, the, the songs that they chose to copy out because printed music wasn't that available. Um, and, you know, this is what Cornish women are choosing at that time. I don't know whether it's fed into the revival or not. I will rely on you to tell me. But I just thought it's really nice to know that there are women in Cornwall choosing songs from around them and further afield and actually building them into their own domestic repertoire, not necessarily for performance, but as a domestic contribution to music in Cornwall. Um, but uh, thank you again for this morning. It's been wonderful. Well, this is amazing. I'd love to know more about this. Maybe that's another future talk. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, I'm doing my cooktop, so I think you will get to hear about it. Great, great, great. <laughs> Barbara and Mike have just published the book. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't got it to hand. Well, can you tell us the book? It's called Above the Tin Stream, and it's um, uh, Philippa Davis' music book. She lived in in Cornwall in the sort of 1740s and she learnt we think spinet or harpsichord and we don't know who she was taught by we have some ideas but she obviously has a collection of handwritten music that she was learning to play from and it does include some songs a lot of them are old we have managed to trace and we know where they came from but some of them are untitled and we haven't traced them so maybe they are local Cornish tunes of that period and that would be fantastic if we could find that. That's wonderful. And I mean, in, your, in that book, you also list quite a few other the women. Not, um, yeah, um, I think so, fantastic work finding other women as well. Yes. Yeah. Who, which, who yes. either. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Sorry, Hilary. <laughs> I was just going to say, which Sue Ellery has got her teeth into. <laughs> and uh, oh, she's right. having a look. And we've, we've been, we've got something from the um, Cascot Parish Archives about the uh, Ernest Excellent. a bit later. But one of the yeah. things about what you just said then, the, the person who analysed her music book thought the tunes rather dull and probably written by people locally. <laughs> and it was like, wow, you <laughs> know, written. So, but obviously, you know, they were described as rather dull. But I'd love to get mm -hmm. what, which ones, what they were all about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be found. You need to get out there and look for it. Which as soon as they let us. Sorry, uh, that also reminds me of um, Lynn Meyers, who came to talk to us. She um, has done loads of research on the bow maidens, and when she started her research, they said, "Oh, there's nothing to be found. There isn't anything. There's nothing on bow maidens." She's now on something like a twelfth book. I mean, she's just <laughs> phenomenal. So there you go. You're right. I think there's so much there still to find. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Well, thank you, Barbara. And um, I think should we leave it there? done a good two hours <laughs> um. <laughs> thank you very very much Leah I'm just uh, it's fantastic to have you on board I'm really delighted that you were able to talk to us today well thank you so much for inviting you uh, inviting me and also thanks a lot for all the people that joined um, and for the patience and the good questions and everything thanks a lot and good luck with your project thank you and Leah and, and you're lots of lovely thanks from lots of people I hope you can see them all Leah I do thank you thank you really nice comments <laughs> bye everyone bye bye